Thank you, Jay, and I am glad to be here. <clears throat> it's good to share the, the podium with Chris. I, anytime we're talking, Chris is recording, so just be careful what you say, okay? Uh, but I, what I want to do, thank you, Chris, for putting that up. I, I, uh, they asked me to talk about rotational stocking, rotational grazing. I chose to do this uh, by, under the theme of keeping it simple, st how to start. You know how not to get bound up in the in the details, but to get it, but to but to uh, but use the tool that we call rotational grazing. So that's the the, the way we're going to deal with this tonight. Now I didn't. I mean, I knew Chris was coming tonight, but I didn't know. I didn't remember I had a quote of Chris in the slides. The reason producers do not know where to start with rotational grazing is because we make it too hard. Okay, we, and here's, here's, here's my thought. Intimidating terminology, intensive grazing, cell grazing, sounds like jail, rotational grazing, management intensive grazing, and then a current uh, buzzword is adaptive multi-paddock grazing. Sounds impressive, doesn't it? You'd like to have that person like describe your tractor. Imagine how big that name would be, right? But really, we're just talking about controlling where the animals are, where we're in charge of what they eat, and when they stop eating on a particular piece of ground so that it, it, it benefits us, okay? <clears throat> now, another in intimidating dimension are, is this idea of paddocks. When I started working, and as I tell my students in the forages class, that was back in the 1900s, right? There was a, I was at the University of Missouri, and rotational grazing was just, I mean, starting to get a little wild. And there was a man north of town named Ron McBee, and Ron was selling fence, among other things, and he had 36 paddocks, 36. And I went up, and of course, Ron's giving us a hard time. He, it's just a, he was giving us a hard time, but he was a good guy. And I went up and he was teaching me about this stuff. And one, one day in the midsummer, I was up there and the cattle weren't there. And I said, Ron, where are the cattle? He said, oh, they're back on the fescue. We ran out of grass up here, right, with 36 paddocks. So 36 paddocks does not grow grass, I'm here to tell you, okay? Do we need a zillion paddocks? No, we don't. I'll give you a couple of examples. It's not intimidating. This is actually from, uh, the picture on the right is from our uh, grazing school a couple years back down in Princeton. Picture in the middle is in Livingston County. This is a mom and pop uh, grass-fed, grass-finished beef operation. And, you know, she's out there on a four-wheeler taking up this, this, uh, this hot wire and giving the animals a new uh, patch of grass. And, of course, on the left is things you've seen before. You know you can find temporary fence posts. We, they're, they're really commonly available. Now, when you think about rotational grazing, I want to stay away from the idea of the, the complicated side. All we want to do is keep animals fed, keep the forages green and growing, okay, and we want to keep the time commitment practical. If somebody Say, I do. Design a system that means you've got to be there every day and move cattle. And you work 30 miles from the farm. That probably is going to get a little old. Now, you may do that already. That may be where you go and recreate. That's fine, right? But we may be where we want to move every other, well, twice a week or once a week. That's all good. It's, the whole thing about this is... I want to, we want to begin to think about the, the fence as a way to allocate feed, right? It's not about the fence, it's about the feed. All right. <coughs> so simple steps to rotational grazing. This is a quote that uh, a, uh, what I consider, who I can, Jim, from Jim Garrish, who I consider to be one of the world's leading experts on rotational grazing. And he says, if you are just starting to learn how to ride a horse, better to start with a well-broke, mature horse than a raw bucking bronco. Now, my, trans, my paraphrase for Jim, learning rotational grazing during the spring flush of grass is like 
learning how to ride a horse in the bronc competition of a rodeo, right? It's not going to end well. It's not, it's not going to be a very pleasure, pleasurable experience for you, right? So how do you get started? How might we get started? First of all, what are the pieces of the rotational system? There are two, right? Assuming we have good perimeter fence, we got water on the farm, we want to think about where that water is and do we need to add some temporary water sites until we maybe decide where we might want to put them permanently. And also then subdividing pastures, not just for the sake of having divided pastures, all right, but because it suits what you want to do with the forage. So, what one expert suggests, and I think it's a good easy way to do this if you've never done it before, start with fescue in the fall and dry cows and just put some hot wire up and, and strip off pasture, okay? The good news about that is we don't have to be concerned with regrowth. We don't have to back fence, if you will. So if I got water here and a big pasture, I can have, I can run a, a hot wire across that, give them some, let them eat it, give them some more, let them eat it, give them some more, let them eat it. Okay, we don't have to worry about back fencing because we're not worried about whether this is growing back right away. Okay, and the other thing about that is dry cows are easy to feed. They're, you know, they're kind of like puppies or dogs, most of them, right? They're just happy to be there. And this is really profitable. If, in fact, if you compare allocating three days of stockpile fescue in the fall versus a week or two weeks, it's almost like you have half again more grass because they don't waste as much and you're able to eat more of it. Now, one of the problems that, that at least I keep running into when we're trying to make, improve a farm, all right? And, I've, and I've, this is, I'm, I've got a real farm in mind that I'm going to be very careful not to name names or places or anything like that, but they rotate like a crazy man or a crazy lady. They, might, they must have 40 paddocks, right? They're out of grass. They were out of grass in October. Their solution, we're going to move twice a day, right? It's like, you're not going to see grass till April. It's not going to help, right? Their problem, in my view, at least at first a while, they, were, they, had, they had too many stock on the farm, and they had the pastures chewed down so low that they're not coming back very quickly, right? And I'll show you what that looks like in a, in a, in a real plant in a second. But one of the things that, that I think we have to do if we're trying to talk about renovating a farm and using the tools that we can, how do we get it to, to you know, do what it's supposed to do, do what we think it can do, uh, and one of them is soil fertility. I'm not going to talk about that tonight, but Chris mentioned it several times about using nitrogen, about soil testing and things like that. We got to know what the, what the farm soil fertility is, but we need to think about what can the, what can the farm do, right? And if it's not yielding enough, is it something you did or something, some management thing that we're doing, uh, particularly with too many stock? If our stocking rate is too high, there's almost nothing you can do besides go get more hay, right, to fix that. Now, uh, let me make, I meant to, meant to mention, there is a tool in Kentucky that the NRCS have in their field office technical guide. We help them revamp it. It's a spreadsheet that if you want to just do a what if scenario on your farm, your neighbor's farm, a farm you're thinking about renting, you can use it. It's very simple to use uh, and you can get an estimate of stocking rate. Or our animal science friends will say, you know, if you have three acres per cow-calf pair, that's at least in the neighborhood of a safe stocking rate. Now, there are other ways to assess whether, you not, whether you've got it stocking rate right or not. Well, let me go past this. This is, this is something I think is very good. It's from Hugh Aljo in the, at the Noble Foundation in Oklahoma, and this is the characteristics of a properly stocked cattle farm, in his view. Number one, 
we always have plant litter or, or litter cover over the ground, no bare ground showing. This is, this is, you know, this is what we're aspiring for. Number two, the end of the season residual heights are three to four inches for cool season grasses and six to eight for natives, more erect species. We're able to maintain a body condition score of five and a half or better on mature animals. And our conception rates are 85% or better. And they, the cows settle in the first 60 days, leave us what that says, first half of the calving season. In other words, whenever it's, you turn the bull in, they're going to cycle. And if you think about the things that have impact that, condition, body condition of the cows, when the breeding season starts, will impact how fast they cycle. A thin cow is going to cycle longer. You're going to have to wait longer on her payday. All right? Now, this... I believe is the most common mistake. This actually is on UK's property. It was a, a research trial we were running and it got me a free ride to the farm with the dean at the time. This is right next to Ironworks Pike where the president's wife drove every day to go to Spindletop uh, Mansion to the, to, to the faculty club. She called the dean. The dean, dean called me and he said, let's go to the farm, Jimmy, you know. And so... Getting a ride to the farm with the dean is not a good way to start the day, all right? Something's up. We get to the, this study, and actually, you're really proud of this study. This is the way it's supposed to look, right? He said, what are you doing here? And he was an animal scientist. He was a great guy. I explained it to him. This is our uh, grazing tolerance plot. We're trying to kill the grass. We want to find out what's tough. He said, that's great. Why do you have to do it here, you know? <laughs> This is, this is a direct quote. I said, well, this is the only place they would give me land. <laughs> you know, it wasn't a week, and I had land in the middle of the farm, <laughs> and we've been grazing there ever since, and that's 30 years ago. Chris, true story. True story. Anyway, the, we want to, and, and I'll tell you something else, and I don't want to go too long because we've got Steve Higgins batting cleanup. Uh, and uh, he's vibrating in place back there waiting to, to, to go. But, uh, <coughs> um, well, I'll, it'll come to me, old man moment. It's not what you take, it's what you leave. I told you that rotational stocking is more about keeping the grass growing. On the left is a pot of orchard grass in the greenhouse clipped weekly at one inch, okay? On the right is one clip monthly at three and a half inches. This is six days of regrowth. Forages that are well managed are going to yield a heck of a lot more than forages that are overgrazed. And the rotational grazing that I'm supposed to be talking about is a way that when, we, when the forage gets down to three and a half inches, we are in charge of where the cattle go and we move them to someplace else, right? We've got a plan, right? Now, there, it is really exciting what is happening in, across the country studying soil. And I'm not a soils person. I had, I had a rotten soils professor, and he's dead, so don't worry. It won't matter if I said that, but, uh, and it wasn't in Kentucky. But we're learning so much about what's going on under the soil. And one of the things that we know is that the... When we cut low or graze closely, we end up with a very pruned and short root system, which means we don't harvest the water. We, have, we don't cover the ground. The soil gets hot. The crowns of the forage gets hot. Plants that we want to hang around, like orchard grass, die sooner than we would have them die. The more we leave on top up here, the more roots we have below. In fact, the root growth mimics the top growth, okay? And that is a reason to where we can prevent, keep from defoliating really, really low, particularly during the hotter times of the year. All right, I'm gonna mention water briefly. It is the most limiting factor. Uh, after having a perimeter fence and so on. 
And one, one point, and it's something we call the 800-foot rule. It was uh, at least, I'm quoting it from the University of Missouri work. And let me just explain what this graph is. This is the utilization rate, the vertical scale from, you know, 0 to 70. That's the vertical scale. The horizontal scale is the distance from water starting at 0 and going to 1,000 feet. What you will see is real close to the water, they use a lot of the forage, and you say, no kidding, right? It, it, right up against the water, there is no forage, so that's 100% utilization. But past 800 feet, they typically don't go that far, usually at least in the humid part of the United States, even in a drought. And you'll just have to trust me, but we've walked enough pastures to know that big, long, long pastures do not get used at the far end. So your placement of water will impact where their animals want to graze, right? Now, this needs a little explaining, and I'll do my best. Fertilizer prices from 20, 2020 through 2021 went nuts, right? And they're at least back to something more normal, but they're still pretty high. Grazing animals recycle, depending on a lot of factors, 80% of the nutrients in that forage that they eat, and it passes through them in manure and urine. Now, I've, now your cows may be better than most, but we want to get them to put it where we want the manure and urine, uh, and the grazing system, the subdividing of pastures, helps them to spread that manure and urine out. This is some work from the University of Missouri at the Forage Systems Research Center. Now, this is a three-pasture rotation, one paddock, starting from, this is feet from water, 100, all the way up to 900. The darker the region, that's the more piles per 500 feet square, Okay. And you see, here's the water in the bottom lower left, and you can see that's where most of the manure and manure went, right? And you don't have to get very far, and it gets pretty sparse. Now you say, well, they put some out here. Guess what was out there? A shade tree. Very good, right? Now this is a, a little smaller paddock, more, ro more paddock, a 24-pasture rotation. Distance from water, 0 to 400. Look at the even distribution. That's more helpful for us in terms of keeping the pasture fertility uh, high and not moving it from the middle of the pasture up next to the water. All right, subdividing pastures. We've got a world of tools uh, to do that with. Chris runs the fencing schools. Uh, we, are, we have a grazing school. We can uh, give you plenty of help with tools like this, but how many paddocks do you need? Well, frankly, it's a mathematical thing. The paddocks you need are the days of rest. Well, it should be the days of grazing divided by the days of rest. Bill, am I right? Is that right? I'm looking at that for the first time because the days of rest is a smaller number than the days of grazing, right? So, days of grazing divided by the days of rest. Oh, you're right. You're exactly right. So if I want to rest 28 days and graze seven, that's four, plus one. That means five, five paddocks are necessary if I want to graze seven, rest 28 days. And that's a, that's a basic sound rotation. But I want to give you, I want to tell you something even simpler than that. Even one fence makes a big difference. This is a field not, I'm helping this farm, and, and we're sweating this field because there's 120 pounds of seed in that field per acre, right? They've seeded it twice, and I'm the consulting agronomist, okay? Am I worried about that field? You're darn right. I'm worried about that field. So, but it's got to go back to work, right? It's been out of production for a year. It's got to go back to work. They want to graze it, and I'm thinking, oh, Lord, you know, you put horses on a pasture, a fresh pasture, and even if it's not heavily stocked, they destroy the thing, right? I said, will you put up a fence, 
right, down the middle of the pasture and split it in half. And, you know, I would ran for cover because they hate electric fence, right? They did. And we now have decent grass still in that pasture. It's resting over the winter. The, the, the horses are somewhere else. But the inter... And you can tell, you, maybe you can tell, they were a little fence post happy, Bill. You know, they were really close together. And they were really worried that the horses were coming through that fence. They were really sweating it. The horses learned really a lot faster than the owners did, right? They stayed at least six feet away, right? The fact that they would put up one fence, they had to put water in, down in the other end of the field, gave us a chance to keep that new seeding alive and so it will get solid enough to go into their regular rotation. So rotational grazing is a tool, nothing more, nothing less, for us to, to manage the forage the way we need, right, for us, okay? And let's, another principle, and I'll just leave it at that, it's usually better to fix what you have than to start completely over. That's a long discussion. And Landry will get to hear the full version in class, starting tomorrow. Okay, there you go. So, what are the basics? Pasture subdivision and water development. How important is water? Real important. How many subdivisions do you need? Not as many as you think. Start simple. It's a learning process that you can start today and experience as the best teacher, but you can ask a friend or you can sign up for Chris's grazing, grazing school or fencing schools and learn a lot more. So that is all. Thank you. Questions? Any questions? Do I have any recommendations on portable water sources? You know, we have used a few different kinds in our grazing schools. Uh, people will say, I can make the small ones work. Typically, the, the recommendation has to do with how fast you can recharge that, that tank and how many are going to drink out of it. So if you have a few, then some of those smaller tanks like you saw would work. If you got a bigger number, then you, you up it from there. And Chris, what else would you say? So, and, and the, uh, the other thing is when you install a watering system, don't, don't plan for what you want to do just right now in the moment. Think about how you might want to expand that system or, um, or subdivide those pastures in the future and then place the waters accordingly. If, if you're working with NRCS, and we've got some great NRCS programs for watering systems, Remember, those guys are busy. They're writing lots of contracts all around the county. So it's up to you to really sit down and think about where the ideal location is for watering waters within your grazing system. Yeah, in, in NRCS, that, that's a cost share. With, is it a cost share practice with NRCS as a grazing? And you don't even, do you have to participate in EQIP to get one? Or, but you don't have to have a contract to get one. Yeah, that's a good deal, and, and they're very intensive and comprehensive. Did you have other questions for Jimmy? Let's thank Jimmy for his presentation.